and we're going to lead off with Todd Gillespie. Todd Gillespie is an operations leader uh, for the Bahrain, Pet uh, Bahrain Petrochemical Company. And, and Todd has more than 35 years experience. Ha, huh, got you beat a little bit. 35 years experience, I'm an old guy, uh, including a lot of grassroots projects, revamps, ex capital expansions, reliability, asset management, uh, planning execution, refinery optimization. The guy knows his way around uh, the process industry, okay? Uh, Todd is highly focused, uh, highly involved in operational excellence programs. You heard about a lot of that this morning, and process safety management. Uh, so, uh, uh, and he has been. Uh, with with the Bahrain Petro uh, with BAPCO for over 25 years uh, and is highly involved in leading a site-wide alarm management project. So with that, uh, click your uh, transmitter on and we will get this we will get this uh, started up. Just a quick overview of BAPCO Bahrain. Um, it's a 82-year-old refinery. Uh, I've got five crude units, three vacuum units, uh, five secondary processing units, um, an FCCU, hydro, two hydro crackers, a couple of diesel hydro treaters. So it's a pretty complex refinery. Um, it's been upgraded, debottlenecked, revamped, repurposed multiple times over its 82 year history. Um, so consequently, a lot of the alarm issues that we had were evolutionary. Um, so how did we get to where we were? Um, the change between analog to DCS made a lot of new alarms. Um, everybody that's ever done it knows that. Um, we retained a lot of switches uh, where we had a, a pressure switch or temperature switch or whatever it was. Uh, so that, that created an alarm and then we added a, another alarm. So you got duplicated alarms, nuisance alarms, the typical. Um, there were no rules in place to guide what changes were good, what changes were bad, what was allowed, what was not, allow what not allowed. Uh, the management of change process was very ineffective because when the guys identified problems, it was on a tag level. So if you wanted to change an alarm setting, an alarm value, it was one MOC for one tag. Uh, so when you're looking at 20, 28,000 tags, which is our current scope, so there's a potential for 28,000 MOCs. Um, so that wasn't very good. Um, when HAZOPs, safety integrity level studies, LOPAs, all those came and do uh, new units, do look back at old units, add some more alarms. That's what we do, right? Um, SISs, PLCs, they all added more. Default configurations, one of the former speakers talked about default configurations, chronic in the business, right? So the DCS vendor is, it's alarm on for everything and it's medium priority. So there, there's your alarm configured. Um, we had very little accountability uh, and we had no performance monitoring. So that's really how we got where we were. Fortunately, we were nowhere near as bad as the previous speakers. So I guess on the plus side, we started from a better point than some others. But some of the things that were obvious were that alarm response had been identified a few times as contributing factors in lost production events, equipment failures, uh, incidents that could have been prevented. Um, the console operators had no faith in the alarm system. They just didn't. Um, alarms were just noise. Um, hundreds, if not thousands, of alarms were disabled. Guys figured out they're bad. I don't, I don't need this. I'll disable it. Um, the alarm system really provided very little assistance for an abnormal event. And it was a major distraction for big upsets. So alarm floods regularly, chattering alarms, nuisance alarms, Alarms generated for normal operating conditions. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but this is a, this is a, a pet peeve of mine. There's nothing wrong. Uh, alarm priorities were inappropriate. Uh, ESD systems were generating dozens, uh, and in some cases, hundreds of post 
trip event alarms. So it's already gone into a, a safe condition, the unit has been tripped, and here's a couple hundred alarms to go with it just for your information. Um, we had system alarms all over the place. Operators couldn't do anything with them, didn't know what they were, didn't know what to do about them. Um, classic problems, I mean, nothing abnormal. Um, so how bad was it? Well, we only had 400,000 recorded events over 90 days. Okay, so that was our baseline data. We took a typical, typical process DCS console. Uh, it wasn't our worst, it wasn't our best. It was about average. And 400,000 events, uh, but nowhere near that many enunciated. So the left side is the total, and the right side is the enunciated. So you can see there's a pretty big difference there. Uh, top line is that is 12,000, top line of the right is 800. So it's a pretty big difference. Um, I'm just going to grab some water here. Um, when we looked at the data, it only gave us 103 alarms a day on average, enunciated. So it wasn't really that bad. Um, but there were 14% of the days that had over 150, and that was all done with several hundred or more alarms disabled. Um, the real concerns were around 2% of our days were over 300. Um, we, our earlier speaker was targeting to get 300. Uh, we were 2% of our days were over 300, which for me is way too much. Um, we had more than 2% of the time in flood, and we had over 100 flood events in 90 days. So every day we we're having at least one flood event. Um, so this is kind of what it looked like. I mean, most of the time we we're below the bar. When we went up, we went way up. So when we embarked on this, our, we had a bunch of defined objectives. Um, the real ones were to put faith back in the alarm system. So the operators, when something went wrong, they could say, yeah, I believe something's wrong because I've got an alarm, not there's more noise for me to deal with. Um, we definitely wanted to get rid of any floods. Floods are bad. Uh, we wanted meaningful alarm descriptors. One of the previous uh, speakers spoke about alarm descriptors, cryptic alarm descriptors. I mean, what is XHQ 972 LL7 low? What is that? Um, we wanted to improve our abnormal situational awareness. We wanted to develop a robust alarm system, um, not a best in class, not, not as good as it possibly could be, but a very robust system. Um, we wanted our operators to be engaged from day one. So that was one of our starting points was operators are going to be part of this from day one. We're not going to impose it on them. We're going to bring it from the bottom up. Uh, we wanted to develop meaningful alarm analysis reports, and all of it was around, this is ISA 18.2's process, uh, which we are very much focused on following. So what were the challenges? Uh, the simple one of what warrants an alarm, okay? Uh, why do I have an alarm? You'll get a hundred different answers if you ask a hundred different people. Why would you have an alarm? Um, so that was a challenge. Empowering the operators to proactively manage their alarm system, not disable alarms. Disabling alarms wasn't achieving much. Proactively managing it would. Uh, removing the comfort factor of pre-alarms. A lot of guys like, oh well, I'll get an alarm before something really goes wrong. So yeah, I, I want to keep that. Do I do anything about it? No. But I'd like to have it anyways. Um, the commitment of internal SMEs to support the documentation and rationalization process. Anybody who hasn't done it, don't, uh, don't underestimate this. It's, uh, I, I hear a couple grunts. Um, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, you've got to, you've really got to commit to it. Um, we had an issue with um, how our refinery is configured with anything, it's a Yokogawa site, 
anything that is non-Yokogawa interfacing with the Yokogawa DCS. Um, that was something that took some work. Uh, the process network, security, data integrity, uh, with that software, you know, firewalls, DMZs, the typical stuff. Uh, that was a challenge. And non-process related alarms, what do you do with them? Uh, we talked to one of our earlier speakers talked about eliminating all system alarms right off the bat. Okay, well, eliminating all system alarms right off the bat may prevent an operator from seeing them, but what do you do with them? They mean something. Um, all of those are pretty big challenges that we faced. We obviously had, like everybody else, on this one area, uh, the top 10 enunciated and chattering alarms were almost the same alarm tags, right? So the top 10 most frequent, the top 10 most chattering were almost the same tags. Pretty common. Um, so where we started? We rewrote the alarm philosophy. We had an alarm philosophy before we started this. The alarm philosophy wasn't robust enough. Uh, I guess the fact that we had one meant that we only had 103 alarms per day as opposed to 10,000 alarms a day. Um, but it wasn't robust enough. It left too many areas for people to do what they wanted to do. Um, so we're putting a lot of rules around that. You can do this, you can't do that. Um, we did a lot of operator training. Why are we doing it? Um, getting the operators to understand what's in it for them. Uh, and I've been in operations for a long, long time, so it was pretty easy for me to talk to them about it. And I've done it before. Um, what does good look like? So they, they really had no vision of, well, when we make this change, what's the difference going to be? What, what, what are we trying to achieve? Um, we had them identify bad actors. We had them tell us their pain points. We gave them the opportunity to tell us what's wrong. Before we go and change stuff, you tell us what you want fixed first. Um, and we engaged everybody. Um, obviously, this costs money. So how are we going to measure success? What are we going to do? How much will it cost? How long will it take? Um, and within that, we expanded the scope of our existing PASS contract services. We've been using PASS for quite a few years before this. Um, we weren't using their tools as effectively as we could. Um, and in retrospect, that probably cost us a lot of time. But we're getting there. We've got a five-year plan. Um, we're about two years into it. And we've made some pretty good progress so far. So we brought, as I said, we brought PASS in early. Uh, we devised a five-year plan to get to, to fully comply with ISA 18.2. We assembled our DNR teams with SMEs from all the disciplines on an as-needed basis. Trying this, OK, well, we need a process engineer. We need a mechanical engineer. We need a reliability engineer. We need a um, maintenance engineer. We need operations engineer. And we need you every day for the next 90 days. Not going to fly, right? Uh, who can we go to when we need you? Um, what can the guys do there? We know that. What do we don't know? We'll park. We'll bring in the SME later. Um, we got all our documentation together. So part of our, our DNR process was gather everything that we had and put it in one room um, so that it's all available. We also used our, our asset um, database, uh, you know, a bunch of other things that we could access through our, our network. Um, we downloaded all the DCS alarm database, and we asked the operators again, here, tell us what your pain points are. Um, tell us. I mean, what is it? It's an alarm not required. It's an elucence alarm. Uh, it's a rationalization opportunity. List them down. And we had pretty good response to that. Because they know. I mean, the guys know what they live with. They, they know what bothers them. Um, and we really assigned one knowledgeable DCS operator from each of the consoles we were going to do full time to address this. So we sacrificed the people. We took them off their normal shift rotation. We said, this is what you're going to do for the next three weeks, two months, however long it took. Um, so what methodology would we use? One of the things that we found really useful, uh, I know this is hard to read, but we did looked at all of the function blocks, the Yokogawa blocks that we had in our DCS. And we said, well, if we look at these, we've got CNF, deviation, high, 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 IOP, IOP is out of range, IOP minus, low range, low, 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 ML low, M high, OOP, 
VL velocity, pi velocity, low. So we looked at all these, all these blocks and we said, well, what do these things are meaningful to an operator? So what we did is we, we said, okay, well, and this is a very, very small piece of them. There's hundreds more. And we looked at all of them and we said, no alarm, no alarm, no alarm, no alarm. Discuss it at the DNR. No alarm, no alarm, no alarm. Discuss it at the DNR. And that's how we got there. So all of those ones that we set to no alarm automatically, that's it. We're not going to talk about it. We're not even going to discuss this configuration. Um, we eliminated all of our alarms that are used as process control logic. I'll get onto that a bit in a few, in a few minutes. Uh, we eliminated all of the DCS and PLC duplicated alarms. We only retained the PLC alarms that, were, that could assist an operator. Uh, nothing that was of a troubleshooting of the system type of alarm. Uh, we got engineering uh, assistance from PASS. We used their software throughout uh, to ensure accuracy and consistency and, and repeatability. Uh, we developed the MOCs at the plant level as opposed to the tag level. So everything with a prefix, in this case 64 and 70, there that was one MOC. Uh, so we could address thousands of tags in one MOC. Um, we developed our alarm priority matrix. I haven't heard anybody talk about this yet. So um, some places we'll use a three by three. Uh, our corporate is five by five. We use five by five for everything. So we did a five by five matrix for alarms. Um, so basically it was looking at, oops, sorry. Uh, time to respond and consequence. All right. So basically we just went, if it's greater than 30 minutes and there's nothing other than a serious consequence, we, we're not going to alarm it, period. Um, and I'm moving up the table. Um, the reference to use of alarm bits for process control, uh, it's, it's easy for control applications guys to take an alarm bit. It's a unique bit of data. Um, they can use that alarm bit for other things. And what we did a lot of was using the alarm bit to start a pump on a high level, stop a pump on a low level. Um, that was a very common application. There was other ones for alarm bits for sequential stepped events um, through PSA units and stuff like that, where alarms were, were coming. There's absolutely nothing wrong, and there was nothing for the operator to do. So we reconfigured all of those. Um, we took a whole lot of uh, similar tags, um, say for example, your tube metal temperatures of furnaces. If you have 100 tube metal temperature sensors on your furnace, well, probably 50% of those are on one side if it's a dual cabin furnace. Um, they both have the same response. So we had one common trouble alarm for each side instead of 100 individuals. Well, it's this, this one. It's a high temperature somewhere in that box. Go look at the box the same response, we had one tag. Um, that eliminated thousands. I mean, you can eliminate so many alarms by doing this. Um, we developed some state-based detection and enforcement um, for our major equipment. We dedicated a single pass engineer to do our DCS data inputs. Uh, one guy. Um, obviously, it's going to take him a while to finish it, but he knows how he's done everything before. Uh, we weren't switching back and forth between different DCS engineers for data input. Um, the audit and force is in place, and we're continuously getting operator feedback. And we get it, we're acting on it. So if guys are saying, you know, we've done this, but, okay, we'll go fix it tomorrow. Um, so what do we get? Um, so from an alarm priority base, this is the alarm priorities, okay, uh, this is where we started. Red is high priority. Yellow is medium priority and magenta is, or sorry, yellow is low priority and magenta is medium priority. That's just how our, our DCS is configured. So this is where we were with over 50% of our alarms configured as high priority alarms. Um, and this is where we are now with 56% of our alarms as low priority alarms. So we've pretty much flipped it over. Um, the Interesting bits here, though, are configured alarms, 10,473. This is just on one, one DCS console, right? Uh, this isn't an entire refinery. 
Um, so we went from 10,473 to 1,337. Um, that's a pretty significant reduction. Now, we're not here yet. This is where we want to be. This is EMUA and ISA 18.2 guideline. We're not there yet, um, but we're pretty confident we will get there because we are looking at this as continuous improvement. We're going to go back again. Uh, once we get everything done, we're going to go back and start again. And we'll do that a couple times. And within that time, we'll get more feedback from the operators where, what their pains are. Um, so from a KPI standpoint, um, we, we're now compliant or better than, we're, we're better than actually, just about everywhere, than AISA 18.2 targets. Um, our number of flood events on this particular DCS, 190 days before, 25 in the last 90 day period that I had data for before I came. So 75% reduction. Time in flood, 2.2% to 0.8%. Uh, enunciate alarms per day, 103 to 62. Uh, days of over 150 alarms, 13. Days of over 300, or sorry, from 13 to 2. Days of over 300 from 2 to 1. Stale and standing alarms for 188 to 45. Unique chattering alarms, 82 to 29. And chattering alarm occurrences, 43,743 to 362. So, pretty significant change. Um, operators are delighted. I mean, the, the guys that were s skeptical are, oh God, thank, thank, thank God you forced us. I mean, our life is so much better. Um, the chattering alarms that we have left are mostly system alarms that I said earlier. We don't know what to do with them yet. We haven't figured out what we're going to do with that alarm information. Um, who's going to get it? How are they going to get it? What are they going to do with it? When are they going to act on it? How do they prioritize it? So that's work in progress. Um, so this, um, my earlier colleague had a similar table up, oops, sorry, um, of KPIs. So this is basically, our goals are just using EMUA manageables, right? So our target, 150, 150 alarms per day, right? Um, that's basically, we, we don't want to exceed it. We consider that a manageable state. We don't want to exceed it ever. Um, so in our before analysis here, we had three days where we exceeded it. Uh, as opposed to our target of 0.3. Our average alarm rate on this unit was 150 a day, which was right on it. This unit was 174 per day, a uh, little above. We had two days over 300 on this unit versus 0.3. Uh, 83 alarms on this unit, 150, obviously that was okay. One versus 0.3. Um, now, if you go now, today, they're all there's no, there's no violations anywhere. I mean, we're, we're better than every metric. Um, and it really didn't take much more than the dedication to do it. 50% um, of our alarms are, or 50% of our units are completed. Um, as I said, we've still got to resolve these system alarms. We're not, we're not real sure how to, how to address these properly yet, but we're working on it. Uh, we want to approve our alarm shelving not necessarily rights, but effectiveness. Um, so that, that's work in progress. Our overview screens and boundary management are work in progress. Um, the process of HVAC alarms, um, unrelated stuff, right? Uh, control room alarms, doors open, uh, that kind of stuff. What do you do with that stuff? Where does it go? Who's going to act on it? We don't want to come into the DCS operator. Um, so that we're, we're working our way through. Um, we're working on developing our plant states. We've got very good equipment states now, state detection for our major equipment. Uh, we can roll that up to a plant state. Obviously, if a major piece of equipment is down, probable that your plant is shut down. So we're rolling, trying to roll all that up into, into developing our plant state, startup, shutdown, decoke, region, whatever we're doing, um, to make that more meaningful. Um, after that, we're going to be going off-sites and into our utilities areas. Uh, 
BAPCO's on the edge of a very major expansion project. Um, this is already being built into the design stage of that project. So we're pretty confident that we're going to get there. Uh, we know from what we've done that we can get there. Um, and we think we can be considerably better than EEMUA guidelines. We're not, we're not trying to get to the, we're below 300. We want to be best in class. So that's our target. Thank you very much. I have a, got a couple of questions from, us, from myself, general interest though. Uh, in your, uh, you started out with huge amounts of suppressed alarms. Mm -hmm. um, when you went through those, did you find alarms that you know, were really important and never should have been suppressed and no one knew that they were suppressed and they had been suppressed for some indefinite amount of time? Um, because that's a pretty typical yes. thing. Yeah, we, we actually didn't find too many that shouldn't have been. We did find hundreds that have been, been that were in al alarm off state for years, for sure. Um, we did find a couple that we thought, well, that really shouldn't be disabled, um, but definitely was configured wrong. Mm -hmm. So rather than configure it right, they'd, well, disable it because it was too much of a hassle to get it changed. Right. So that was part of the problem, was, was having an MOC uh, process that was effective. We didn't have one. And then the other thing, uh, your uh, you reduced the number of configured alarms by about 90%. Yeah, on this plant. And not, not on all plants, but right. on this one we did, yeah. And that's kind of a typical thing, too, but yeah. also people generally find that they think they have something alarmed that they didn't, and they also add some alarms in rationalization. Was that your yes. experience? Oh, yes, definitely. Most definitely. We added alarms. Definite. Most definite. We added probably 150 on this, this particular unit, but we removed several yeah. thousand. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? We've got a couple of minutes. Yes. Yes. Tag level, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. The approval process hasn't changed. Um, what we're doing is the MOC after DNR. So once we've completed the DNR, we're capturing all of the data as a, well, I mean, their, their tools go into Excel seamlessly. All right, so we're capturing into Excel. Um, that file, that data file, has before and after. Um, and you can filter the columns you want to see the before and the afters. Um, and basically, that is your backup for the piece of paper that gets signed. Um, but we are doing it at the plant level. Um, simply because it, it's just too burdensome to do it any other way. Question here. Uh, yeah. uh, my name is Rush Dan from Petronas, Malaysia. Right. Can you uh, share with us um, how do you reconcile two sets of data? Because in your presentation, yeah. you mentioned that you got into a, a room full of documents and then you also downloaded set points of the DCS. Correct. So I'm pretty sure you're going to find some difference? Um, what we found differences were ma mainly in our asset database versus what was in our alarm database. Uh, we didn't find too many discrepancies with our PNIDs or our procedures, um, although there were a few. That's definite. There were a few. Um, where, where we found them wrong we said, okay, well, which one, which one are we going to pick? So before we go any further, we'll say, well, what's our starting point going to be for this one? And that's, that's how we looked at it. Um, if, it was, if it was a hard and fast, you know, it's maximum level working pressure or relief valve set pressure or whatever, it's easy. Okay, well, let's take 90% of that. There's a starting point. So, yeah, we did find a few, um, but we kind of just used a logical approach to which one should we use as, as the, our starting point. Because we're going to look at, we're going to rationalize anyway. Yeah. Okay, one more question here. Uh, with the example you gave here, what's the number of, approximate number of physical I.O. that you based those uh, thousand or so alarms off of? Uh, it would have been about, on this plant, probably 300 and, it's two units. It's a hydrogen plant and a big vacuum unit. Probably 375, 400, I'd say. 
A boat? No. Thank you very much. Okay.